Flair is going to resign as a booker at the end of February. And not too long after that, you have maybe your first of a few backstage confrontations with Mr. Flair. Uh, you come back after having a, a match and feeling pretty good about it. And then it turns to shock you right in your book. Cause you run into Ric Flair who had been waiting for you. This is directly from your book. Flair had just resigned as booker. And I guess he decided to take his frustration and anger out on me. What the hell are you doing out there? I didn't know what to say. Hell, I didn't even know what the question meant. And I told Flair so. Quote, I mean, you do all that shit. And just because you think those two, pointing at Ross and Cornette on the TV monitor, put you over, you think you're over. Don't you understand no one cares about you? I was floored. All I could do was stare blindly as the nature boy continued his condemnation. You'll be in a wheelchair by the time you're 30. And nobody's going to care. Now, we know that 1990 is uh, not a fun time for Ric Flair in his wrestling mm -hmm. career. He's unhappy with the way things are going with his career and Jim Hurd and his contract and his push. Yeah. And there's a lot of pressure of being on the quote-unquote booking committee, and some people would say running it. Rick would deny that. And being the champ. And then sort of being blamed that business is down. But in reality, business is down on the other channel as well. Mm -hmm. uh, people say it's a cyclical business, but... I'm sure it's a lot of pressure for Rick, but this is the guy who helped hire you and who, even at that point, a lot of people were saying is the greatest wrestler of all time. And now he's just taken the wind out of your sails. Looking back, it's Sigmund Freud's theory of transference, you know? Yes. I mean, the example we were taught in high school is the guy's having a bad day, takes it out by yelling at the dog. Yes. In this case, I was just that. You were the dog. I was the dog. Um, Did you know the, that at the time? No, no. I mean, it hurt so bad to the point where, uh, you know, it's funny because when I talked about my ECW promo about turning 30, and I think I likened it to uh, neighbor Tom Daw standing on the, <laughs> the Foley fence and robbing every home run that I hit in wiffle ball because I was a pull hitter. And uh, I think my mom or dad suggested I hit it somewhere else other than when Tom Doe was standing. And even back when I was six or seven years old, that seemed like cheating. Yes. And so I used that as a promo to say, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be 30. I could ease over that line, but that's not my way. I'm going to hit 30 the same way I hit 29. And when it's a yeah, pretty effective promo. And at that time, a lot of people did not know who the... Uh, uh, the veteran talking about being in a wheelchair by the time I was 30 was. But, uh, I mean, there was something to that. I mean, all the veterans were right about the, the hip replacement and the damage I was doing. But, I'm, you know, I'm happy to say, especially when we begin the Foley Weight Loss Challenge, you know, I'm going to drop some dramatic LBs. But I'm 50, uh, 50, am I 57 or 50? I'll be, I'll be 58 this year. You almost made it twice almost as far. Almost doubling no that. Wheelchair. No Come wheelchair. Off. I walk a little slow at airports, you know, get around a little slowly. All things considered, doing pretty good. But when you look up to somebody the way I did to Rick, yeah. whether or not he's got a reason uh, a, you know, a reason for being angry in general, that hurts. Yes. Yeah, it really hurts.